All right, the last in our um, set of World War II visuals. Again, these are just to give you uh, kind of some brief background uh, on some of these topics. They definitely show up um, in other parts of um, other parts of what we're studying, and, and probably also in um, the focus question uh, project. Uh, that you're going to be taking a look at as we go through this unit. Uh, this one here, uh, this visual is the Enola Gay. It's the name of the plane uh, standing behind that fellow there. His name's Paul Tibbetts. Uh, and the Enola Gay uh, is famous because she's the first uh, plane, or she's the plane that drops the first atomic bomb in uh, the history of warfare. Uh, both atomic bombs that have been dropped have been dropped by the United States. Uh, the Enola Gay drops the Little Boy Bomb on Hiroshima. Uh, and another plane called the Boxcar will drop uh, the Fat Man Bomb on Nagasaki. Uh, Boxcar is actually pretty close uh, to where we're at, uh, over in Dayton, Ohio. You can go see that one. Uh, the Enola Gay is at the Smithsonian uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, Paul Tibbetts uh, is the pilot. Uh, and the atomic bomb project was so secret um, that nobody was supposed to know it was being worked on. Uh, and even when it was loaded onto the plane, he was the only person who had been fully briefed uh, about uh, what was supposed to happen. There was a maneuver he was supposed to do uh, after the bomb was dropped, and then that was supposed to allow, uh, allow them to get some pictures uh, of what had happened uh, as they dropped this bomb on Hiroshima. The reason we dropped the atomic bombs... Uh, is Japan wasn't surrendering, uh, and so it was either drop these bombs and try to induce a surrender or an invasion. Uh, the invasion had been planned. It was going to be Operation Olympic, uh, but in that they had uh, estimated that over a million Americans would be wounded or killed, uh, and more and more Japanese, obviously, and citizens and soldiers, uh, and so it was decided to try this first. Uh, the atomic bomb was created as part of the Manhattan Project. We've got a lot longer video uh, where I show you some of the sites um, that are uh, there with the Manhattan Project. Uh, Paul Tibbetts uh, supposedly always kind of felt kind of guilty uh, about what he'd done. Uh, the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Obviously, with an atomic bomb, you can't just target soldiers. Uh, but 150,000 people uh, are pretty much vaporized uh, by the initial blast. Uh, and then many more will die from radiation poisoning or uh, wounds that they get um, as the, the damage spreads out uh, from where the center of that bomb was. Uh, Paul had named the plane after his mother, uh, which is nice in some ways, but then you're naming a plane after mother. It's kind of infamous in world history, but maybe she appreciated it. I don't know. Um, but that's where uh, the, uh, the plane ends up getting its name. Uh, the man who decides to drop the atomic bomb is this guy. This is President Harry Truman. Uh, Harry Truman was the fourth vice president of Franklin Roosevelt. He was uh, he'd only been vice president for a couple of months uh, before Franklin Roosevelt dies, uh, and he is he takes the oath of office to become our president. Uh, the atomic bomb project was so secret that he didn't even know it existed uh, until. President Roosevelt had died. Uh, and so Harry Truman from the state of Missouri, uh, he is our last president um, not to attend college. Uh, and so every other president since him has, has been a college graduate. He was actually a haberdasher. He was uh, at a men's clothing store uh, before he got involved in politics. But he's from the state of Missouri uh, and works his way all the way up to being president uh, of the United States. Uh, so he makes that decision. Uh, that they are going to uh, use the atomic bomb. Uh, this is the guy that's going to lead us through kind of that period where Germany's gone, uh, but we're still fighting uh, in the Pacific. These guys uh, are going to fight in the Pacific as well. Uh, I think one of the coolest stories of World War II, uh, one of the things that has to happen is there, uh, there's a tactic that's adopted called island hopping, uh, where people would go from... Uh, from island to island, uh, because you don't have obviously the big land mass that you do in Europe, uh, well, you need to be able to communicate from ship to ship and island to island. And so they were always looking for codes uh, that uh, that they could use. Uh, 
Uh, and one of the codes the Americans found was the Navajo language. Uh, Navajo is a Native American tribe, uh, but their language wasn't written. Uh, it was just a spoken language, and so it wasn't like the Japanese could go get a book. Uh, and so what they do is they recruit um, young men from the Navajo tribe um, to come and to, to put a code inside of that language and to speak that language. Most of them didn't speak the language either. They had to be taught by the elders of their tribe. Uh, but it's a, it's a uh, code that's never broken. It's not even declassified uh, until the 1960s. Uh, I've got a book on my shelf that uh, there's only one of these guys that wrote um, his, his autobiography about his experiences. And it's a really neat uh, view of, of what was going on. Uh, there weren't very many of these code talkers, less than 50. Uh, and so they were very important. Uh, but they also didn't want the uh, code to come out. And so each one of these guys had a soldier who was assigned to them to protect them. Uh, but also to make sure that uh, they weren't taken uh, as live prisoners by the Japanese. Uh, now, no code talkers actually had to be killed by the, the guy that was guarding them, uh, but that was you know, obviously one of the things that, uh, that could have happened um, had, uh, had they you know, been close to capture. Uh, Nicholas Cage did a movie called Wind Talkers uh, several years ago uh, that kind of tells the story of these guys, uh, not all historically accurate, but... Um, good nonetheless, and there is a copy, uh, of course, in the film library. Uh, the last one we've got here is the surrender of Japan. After the dropping of the two atomic bombs, uh, Japan agrees to surrender. Uh, they surrender here. You see Douglas MacArthur signing the surrender papers uh, in Tokyo Bay, uh, and this is the battleship, the USS Missouri. Uh, now, the USS Missouri is in Hawaii today. If you get a chance to go to Pearl Harbor, uh, you can actually go over and get on the USS Missouri uh, and see those surrender papers uh, that uh, are there. Uh, Japan, J Japanese surrender was unconditional, uh, though we did agree to let the emperor stay in ceremonial power. He had to give up uh, claims of divinity and any kind of control over the government, uh, but he becomes kind of like the Queen of England uh, is for that country today. He's a ceremonial leader uh, that uh, is there. Um, but this brings an end to... Uh, the war in the Pacific and an end to World War II um, as a whole. Uh, and so that's where um, World War II finishes. Uh, and uh, once we get done, we head into uh, the post-war period and we'll see what happens to Japan then.